Welcome back, guys. We are back on the Model A, the one that I wrecked a few weeks ago. We've got some damage to repair. So we drew a bunch of parts up in CAD. We sent them off to the laser cutter, and now they're back. So we gotta put it all together and weld it all up. There's probably more fabrication in this episode than any episode I've done previously, and I'm excited about it. I had a ton of fun on this one. You guys might not be building a Model A chassis at home, but we're gonna use some really simple tools and some really simple methods to build some really cool stuff. I think you might come away from this one wanting to build something crazy of your own. This one was a blast. I hope you guys enjoy it. I'm gonna walk you through the entire process. Don't forget to subscribe if you're enjoying the build. I want you guys to come back and see this thing on the road, hopefully in no time. So let's dive into it. Believe it or not, everything that we need to build the front end of the Model A chassis is right here in this very flat box. It's just arrived from Send Cut Send, which did not sponsor this video, just to be clear. I'm a normal customer just like anybody else, which means I'm incredibly excited for its contents. Inside the package is the result of all of the CAD work that we did in the last episode. So if you missed it, make sure you go back and give it a watch so you can tell what we're trying to build. First on the list are the front upper control arm mounts, the simplest parts of the entire project. These two small folded over pieces wrap around the ends and the entire thing gets boxed in. It's a great place to start the project and get our feet wet. You'll notice that a common theme for all of the parts that we're trying to build in this episode is that there is a lot of fixturing and jigging. I need to make sure that all of these parts are true, square, and properly spaced. I'm also going to be tigging this entire project because the only way to get better is lots and lots of practice. You're also going to see a bunch of different tools in this episode, so let's run through them real quick. First on the list is the Fireball Tool Magic Square. And this thing has a ton of uses, I couldn't even begin to cover them all. But for us, it serves as a great, large, true and square surface to fabricate against. Next, I've got the strong hand sliding bar clamps, which will come in really handy thanks to their adjustable throats. And then last but not least, I've got these. They're called 123 blocks, and I first learned about them from Adam Savage, whose YouTube channel is a must watch. They're useful in a lot of different ways, but the obvious one comes from their name. They measure one by two by three inches, and they are precision machined to exactly those dimensions. They're gonna come in really handy on today's project because the inside dimension of every bracket that we're making measures two inches, and we can use them to square everything up and properly space every single component. You can see me putting it to work on these upper controller mounts by putting it between the two main tabs. And by clamping down on it, everything will stay exactly where it's supposed to. Now, 123 blocks can be incredibly expensive. For example, on McMaster car, this version fetches nearly 250 bucks for a pair. But I'm gonna put a link in the description to some that cost just 25 bucks from Amazon. And if you're wondering how good they are at that price, I put my calipers on them and they are within half of a thousandth which is far more accurate than anything I'm ever gonna need, I'm pretty confident. And for good measure, I'll link the other tools in the description as well. After all that blabbering, we've got two finished upper control arm mounts. One's been hit with a Scotch-Brite pad, while the other one still shows its heat marks, but both turned out reasonably well. So let's crank up the difficulty. All right, guys, we got our feet wet. I'm ready to tackle the front lower mounts. I think these are gonna be the toughest part of the whole thing. There's a lot of pieces that go to this. There's gonna be two of this shape, which is each side of it. We've got lots of pieces that we have to bend up kind of two shape. I think this one goes on top and then bends around and then around here. Uh, this one, let's see, I think it goes, I don't know. <laughs> I gotta figure this out, I gotta look at my model. These will go on the bottom. And then we've also gotta take this tube and cut it up, machine it to the right length. It's gonna be our end piece. We're gonna to cope to this later. There's a lot of stuff that goes into this bottom mount. So hopefully it comes together well. Let's head over to the brake and bend these up, try to get them all to shape and see how it looks. As you'll see here in a moment, there is a lot of bending required for these front mounts as there is for the rest of the project as well. 
This is a slow and painstaking process that requires sneaking up on each and every bend, making sure not to overdo it so that we don't trash a part. Every single bent part has to be done twice, once for each side of the Model A. And as you'd expect, every single bend needs to be perfectly positioned. Up next, we need to cut some tube segments and shorten them to exactly two inches. These are gonna make up the ends of the front mounts, and it's imperative that the dimensions are correct so that it doesn't throw anything else out of whack. Now I catch a lot of flack about running a grinder without a guard on it, and if you guys want me to talk about why I do that in another episode, leave a comment and I'd be happy to do a segment about it. With some rough tube segments cut, I'm chucking them up in the lathe and machining them down to exactly two inches in height. This will mean it matches our drawing and matches the height of our sheet metal parts, and everything should line up the way that we want it to. Here you can see all of the parts in total and just how complicated these front mounts really are. It'll take a lot of care to make sure we don't warp or twist anything or have anything off kilter, but I'm feeling pretty confident about it. So let's get this thing jigged up. That one, two, three block is coming in handy once again, making sure that the inside dimensions of this thing are perfectly spaced for our heim joints. And with everything clamped together, you can see we've got really nice reveals and nice corners to fill with some weld. I don't know about you guys, but I know that there's no way I could make parts that fit together like this by hand. And it's one of the reasons I love using CAD software. Not to mention the fact that all of these parts and the material was less than $500 delivered to my door. It might sound like a lot on the surface, but material costs are through the roof these days. And when you calculate the amount of time that I've saved by not having to make all of these pieces by hand, it seems well worth it to me. Not to mention, these will turn out better than anything I could do on my own. After a couple hours of work, we've got two finished front lower control arm mounts, and I'm pretty happy with how they turned out. I think it's really cool to see CAD design parts turned into something as real and as complex as this on my workbench. Next, we've got our upper coilover mounts, and these measure 3 16 in thickness. I initially planned on bending them over and welding the insides, but because I'm taking them, I decided I should clean up any of the kerfing, so I split them apart and built them in multiple pieces. For all of these parts, I'm using a half inch steel dowel between the mounting holes to make sure they remain in alignment. And as long as the dowel can freely move in and out of the part, I know that I'm good when I'm ready to put a bolt through these parts later. It turned out the coilover mounts were the easiest part to build of the entire day, and although there's not a lot to them, I think they turned out rather nicely. And now it's on to the final part of the project. All right, so we're finally ready to build our final part, the actual cross member. And as I get this thing set up, I figured it's a pretty good time to address one of the questions that a lot of you guys had, which is, why don't I build some sort of crumple zone into the chassis instead of building it the same way that I did before, although we are changing some geometry. And I like where your head is at. I think that crumple zones definitely serve a good purpose, but the problem is, is one, I'm not an engineer. I don't know how to properly design that so that it crumples the way that I want to. I could take a pretty educated guess at it, but I don't want my truck to break in half when I have an accident. But more important than that is, crumple zones work in cars because the entire thing is designed to work that way. The cabin of the car itself doesn't deform, but everything around it does to absorb impact. Well, the Model A is really, really small. Most people don't realize just how small it is till they see it in person, and it's always their first comment. They can't believe how tiny it is. It's about the size of an old Mini, just to be clear. 
If the Model A were to deform in an accident, I'm going to get hurt. There's no room for anything to deform other than to begin coming into the cabin. If my frame rails had crumpled when I hit that car, well, the engine would then come into the cabin with me because the engine isn't going to crumple and the firewall is made of aluminum. It is not going to stop an engine. And if the engine comes in, I'm going to get a lot more seriously hurt and we don't want that. So I like the idea, but ultimately I want to treat this chassis as a true structural piece. And I mean, obviously it is, but I don't want it to deform. Think of it more like a roll cage. A roll cage is designed to not deform whatsoever. Now, we don't have a full cage, but the chassis is still this whole single unit, and I want everything else around me to deform. I'd rather have the impact absorbed by seat belts and experienced G-forces than I would have the truck crumple up with me inside of it. So, we're gonna continue down this path. Let's get this thing built. Now it was really important to me to make sure that the cross member is square and true in every direction. So clamped inside of this thing, I've got one, two, three blocks to confirm the dimensions. I'm also using squares in several places to make sure everything is straight. And before welding, I'm making tacks in regular intervals so that we don't introduce too much heat to the part. With tacks just about everywhere though, and multiple one, two, three blocks wedged in place, it's time to fully burn in the perimeter. And there we have it, our final piece almost fully welded. We've got a little bit left to do, but it's together enough for us to roughly assemble this thing on the workbench. And I'm happy to say that after all of this heat was applied, it still seems straight, true, and square, which is crucial for a suspension member. So let's cut some temporary frame rails and mock this thing up. So there's still a few more pieces to build, such as the parts that will mount from the cross member to those front lower control arm mounts and the parts that'll mount the steering rack, but this is turning out pretty sweet and it's coming along rather well. It took longer to weld than expected, but this is a lot of progress to cram into two days and I think we're gonna make plenty more in the coming ones. All right, we have it all mocked up. None of this stuff is measured out and positioned correctly fore and aft on these, on these frame rails, but I wanted to see it all in place and I'm really happy with how it all turned out. Everything fits really nicely. Everything looks pretty good. I think especially with a coat of paint on it, we're gonna be in business. I think the welds came out pretty well. I'm, I'm pretty happy with them, especially for how much of a TIG amateur I am. Uh, none of them are what you would call weld porn, but it all looks pretty good. I'm happy with it, I had a bunch of fun with it. Uh, these mounts wrap around the top of the frame now, which is what's different there. I like the look a lot better and it should be a lot stronger. These stayed the same as last time, and then obviously we totally re-engineered the front. We're gonna talk about rack placement here in a moment, but for now, this is the tentative plan, although I did design this so I can overlap this, move this forward or this back uh, to where it was originally, and just attach them across the face of this. So we've got a little bit of modularity and some options, uh, and if I move this back, I'm gonna bridge this with a piece of round tube coked to each one, so still should look nice. All in all, I'm pumped on this thing. I think it came out good. And man, it was a lot of work, but it should work. Honestly, this was a very fun episode for me. It was a ton of work, it was a ton of welding, but I had a lot of fun practicing and just getting that TIG practice in, finding the rhythm, getting the filler going in, getting that pedal going right. I didn't need to TIG weld any of this. I could have been done 10 times faster if I just hit it all with the MIG, but it's a great place to get some practice and it was on the workbench, it was nice and easy and honestly, I, I just had a blast. Probably have 10 hours into welding this whole thing up, if I had to guess. Now, before I wrap the episode up here, I've got two more things for you. One is you've seen this new tool in the background of the episode. I pointed at it earlier. This is an Arbor Press. It is a 12 ton Arbor Press, it's huge. 
If you guys want to know more about it, I'm kind of tempted to do maybe a short weekend bonus episode all about this thing, how it works, why I bought it, because I'm really excited about it. It's the coolest tool I've ever bought, also the biggest. But if you guys don't care enough to see it, then I won't waste my time. So leave me some comments and let me know if you want to see this thing. Otherwise, I won't bother. But more important than that, we're going to talk quickly about rack placement. In the last episode, I mentioned how I wanted to move the rack fore and aft, hence the redesign of the front, uh, in order to solve some bump steer. Now, I was relatively confident I knew what I was talking about, but several people reached out and said, hey, you're going to affect Ackerman with that, not bump steer. You need to move the rack up and down or the tie rod ends up and down. Now, I definitely know that that is the primary adjustment for bump steer. I'm aware of that part of it. Uh, I'm under the impression that the tie rod ends are moving in an arc due to how far back the rack was, but I don't know everything. So I'm going to heed your advice. I'm going to do some more research and I'm going to leave what bridges our cross member to those front pieces out of the equation for the moment. I'm going to try to build in some adjustments so I can move the rack around and get this thing just right. Uh, thank you guys for calling me out on that. I want to get this correct and I know you guys want to see me get it correct. So we're going to play with rack position and try to get this thing working correctly. We'll see how it goes. With all that said, this episode is done. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I appreciate you guys watching. Leave me some feedback. We'll be back on Tuesday or maybe this weekend with a short bonus episode about the press, but either way, I've got a lot of stuff to get done this weekend. I'm excited. I think I'm going to work on the 308, but we'll see. We'll just have to see what Tuesday brings us. I will catch you guys then. Thank you as always for the support.